Hi, welcome to the Cinema Path. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the FLIR MR160 Imaging Moisture Meter. This instrument is equipped with a thermal camera, and that thermal camera can be used to detect moistures. And the reason for that is because moistures, due to evaporation, can cause thermal variation, and a thermal camera can pick up on that. But that's not generally enough. So this instrument is actually also equipped with probes that can measure the actual content of the moisture in whatever that you suspect might be causing problem. So the thermal camera is used as a guide for you to be able to find potential uh, problem areas. Now I know that most of the people who watch my channel are interested in electronics and I'm a huge fan of uh, instruments that can do more than one thing. So I'm also going to take a look at it and see how well it would behave if you wanted to use it for electronic debugging and looking at PCBs, you know, detecting shorts and failures and, and things that might have, uh, might have gone bad on your board. So uh, this would be very helpful also and if you're a homeowner or if you're thinking of buying a home you could save yourself a ton of money by finding moisture problems early. This particular unit costs about $600 and of course if you can find a moisture problem that's beginning to develop you know, somewhere in the foundation or in the wall it can save you 10 times this cost over very very easily. So let's go ahead take it apart uh, out of the box, take a look at it and if it's possible to disassemble it and do a teardown I will do that as well but I have a bunch of experiments uh, designed for it let's take a look and see how it behaves and here is the FLIR MR160 out of the box. One of the very first things I noticed is that this thing is built like a tank. I mean, this is a solid, solid design. It's no surprise that it is rated for a 3 meter drop. It has 2 year warranty and a 10 year warranty at the detector. So it really is a very durable unit and it, I think it's going to survive in your uh, toolbox quite nicely. The screen itself is a 320 by 240 pixel 65,000 color screen, which is okay for given the kind of sensor that it is used. It's um, not very large but at the, again at the same time I don't think you would need a much bigger screen than that and it also keeps the size of the unit fairly small. The buttons in the front have this nice click feel to them. It's a little difficult to push the directional switches you might get a little frustrating but overall I'm fairly happy with them. You can see the laser button, the return button. This is a reviewing of the pictures and taking pictures and of course uh, the power button there. So it's pretty straightforward. The interface is really simple and we'll take a look at it when we turn it on. Here at the bottom side is going to you give you the option to attach the external pinned moisture sensor as well as the micro USB for charging. Now the battery that's inside it is a 3000 milliamp hour lithium ion battery and they claim that it will take 18 hours of continuous use or about four weeks of uh, use in the field which I think is reasonable uh, considering my experience with it. I think that that is fairly accurate. Now at the back is where you're going to have obviously the thermal sensor. Now when I received my unit if you look at it you can see that there is a little scratch on the surface of the sensor. I'm not sure why, but that does not show up at all on the thermal image, most likely because it's invisible to the wavelength of the detector. The detector is the flare lepton microbolometer, very famous now used in a couple of their products. It's a 4800 pixel, it's 80 by 60. You know, it's reasonable again for this type of application, it, it works quite well. It has a very good sensitivity, 0.15 degrees Celsius. It has a 9 hertz update rate, which of course is limited by regulations uh, because you, you're not allowed to go over 9 hertz for commercial products like this and it has a field of view of 51 degrees by 38 degrees which is again okay for the type of distances this is intending to use uh, at the, you know looking at ceilings and walls and floors and so on so it's pretty pretty good for that the other thing is that it has a laser pointer so the laser pointer is aligned with the center of the screen so when you push that button on the thermal image you will see a little crosser that will show you exactly what area you're looking at. This is very handy because this does not have the image blending capability. Some of the other thermal cameras by FLIR have where there's a, a visual camera as well when it blends the two uh, together. That's a patented technology from FLIR. It doesn't have that, probably doesn't really need it for what is intended. Now this area over here is your touchless moisture detector. Now in order to, de to detect moisture without actually uh, connecting pins to it, you have a few different options. You can either do it electromagnetically or capacitively, but the principle is the same. The idea is that you would send a wave into a material and because the presence of moisture changes the dielectric uh, behavior of that material, you can detect that. So for example, this one is a capacitive one, the capacitance of the material will change. But it's not just looking at the capacitance, it's also looking at other things, uh, for example, how much energy is lost in the material, which again is correlated to the resistance as well as the type how much moisture is in there. Now this can be sometimes unreliable depending on what's 
what, what the surface is you're measuring, if there's metal in it, if there's mesh in it, and so on. So that's why there's also the pin type moisture measurement, which relies on the measurement of resistance. So the com combination of these two is very powerful. It gives you a, a nice overview on exactly what the type of moisture you're looking at. Now the moisture is reported in a WME, which is what wood moisture equivalent. And the sensitivity is about plus or minus 5%, which is okay because you're trying to find out uh, if there's a problem not necessarily fully characterizing uh, the material you're looking at. It supports nine different material groups, so it has a table that you can look up at what type of material you're about to measure, and then you can use that in order to set that so that it can do its own algorithms and do basically its own lookup table and, and give you a correct result. And, uh, you know, it goes from 0 to 100%, which makes sense. And the depth of penetration for the touchless is about 19 millimeters, which is 0 0.75 inches. So that's the depth that it's going to look at depending on the material surface. That's what you're going to get. That's the depth that it can look for moisture. So overall, very cool. Now we have a good idea of exactly what it does. And uh, so now it's time to play around with it. Let's take a look and see what we can find inside this unit. The disassembly seems to be fairly straightforward. I just removed the four plastic pegs that were there and then the four screws uh, were removed and you can see that it easily separates. And I haven't disassembled it yet but you can tell that obviously this is a two board construction or at least two section construction and uh, then there is connection between the two halves. So I'm going to have to unplug this very carefully so we can separate these two halves from each other and take a close look at them. And here we have it, the two halves separated from each other and the construction is really nice, it's very solid as to be expected. And this is a side that has the LCD screen and obviously the main PCB for where the processor and all the other electronics are, are in there and they're all on the other side of this board. On this side you only have the buzzer, they're connected to the lepton imaging sensor which is this right here, which will plug right into here. There are various other things to connect to the other side. Here's our pin moisture detector sensor connector and of course the main micro SD which holds the operating system and it's glued in place uh, which again makes sense because this is supposed to be rated for a 3 meter drop and if you drop this and this is loose it's going to just pop out and then you're going to have no operating system. So they've taken care of that. The screws are actually nicely I tapped in there with the metal inserts, great, which means even though it's not supposed to be really disassembled, but it's good that they've done that. And you can see it's very serviceable. If your battery ever dies, it looks like it houses very standard uh, lithium ion batteries in there, which can easily be replaced, which is fantastic. This is going to last for a very, very long time. And uh, we're going to take apart this so we can take a look at it on the other side. And you really don't have any complaint except one little thing there. And this is the way this laser uh, module is connected. The cable that's connected to it it doesn't seem to be very strong and I'm going to focus on that I'm going to show you in just a second. We'll take apart everything. I will not take apart this because really there's underneath it there's just a lepton imaging sensor there's nothing else other than that and I don't want to uh, disturb the alignment of the laser and the image the, the thermal detector there just in case uh, I mess that up and it will be difficult to close it back together. But other than that it should be very interesting. So I'm going to take this apart but before that let me show you what I mean by this. Now again, this is a 3 meter uh, drop rated uh, instrument here and you can see this cable is just not really, you know, stuck there very nicely. It's a, not, a, not the best soldering job. So I may actually clean that up myself a little bit just so that this uh, wouldn't cause any problem because, you know, with vibration this will eventually disconnect from the laser. I mean the worst that can happen in that case is that you just won't have a laser pointer which would be kind of annoying to have to uh, open it and connect it back together but everything else is otherwise pretty solid. It would also be nice to have a piece of uh, tape over here so that this thing doesn't get disconnected over time and I'm going to add that as well. But other than that, I'm sure everything is fine because again this has the warranty, it is rated for a 3 meter drop so and Flair really knows what they're doing when it comes to uh, making things that are, can withstand that kind of abuse. So let's go ahead, take this board out. I'm very curious to see what's underneath. And here we have everything. I've already taken the LCD screen off as well. And you can see it's a very basic LCD with a parallel interface, LED backlit. And here's a part number there so you can look it up and see what it does exactly. And this is directly connected to the board. Now, take a look at this and see how brilliantly simple it is. As it always with good engineering solutions, it is very simple. Everything is handled by a PIC32. This is a PIC32 MX470L. This is a 512 kilobyte version. It has 128 kilobytes of RAM. It has a whole slew of uh, analog and digital interfaces as well as USB, graphic drivers and so on. Everything directly built onto it. It's a 150 MIPS processor 
fairly capable obviously for this task is perfect because it can do everything including interfacing with the USB, interfacing with the laptop processor, driving the LCD screen and handling all the buttons and everything is all built into this and it has others. One other trick up its sleeve and I will tell you that in just a second. There is an NXP a real time clock module over here, this one, which is coupled to a 32 kilohertz uh, oscillator there and crystal there and of course that will give you all the calendar and date and time functionality. Now as I mentioned before, this has a pinless capacitive type of moisture detector and how is that done? Well that's done by a capacitor obviously and that capacitor is in fact built on to the other side of the chassis and this is the cable that goes directly to it and that plugs into this board on the other side and what, how is it handled? Well there is actually a CTMU, which is a, a charge time measurement unit functionality is built into this PIC32. And this CTMU unit essentially is an ADC combined with a current program of a current source and a whole bunch of digital circuitry, which allows you to measure capacitance directly connected to some of its pins by switching current in and out of the measuring decay times and so on. It can measure capacitance, it can measure the changes in capacitance, and of course that's perfect because all they need to do is to connect that to their capacitor sensor and then uh, run some algorithms on that and figure out moisture content from that. So they're using the capacitor measurement capability of this for a very interesting um, use. Normally this is used obviously for LCD touch screens and PCB uh, embedded uh, touchless buttons and things like that. But normally it's not typically used for moisture detection so I'm pretty happy to see it done this way. How the buttons are obviously handled over here and other than that really really straightforward and um, this means that they need very few external components as you can see you have a regulator there some battery management stuff but other than that really there is nothing there it's so simple I love that and uh, here's the connector again for the capacitor connector battery connector and there's actually a few other connectors here that are not used this is for the laser and uh, there's some written labels on it that I'm sure you can go up and look if you like other than that I'm very very happy with design let's take a look at the other side just so you can see there is the chassis where this thing came out of very nice very solid all the buttons uh, exactly as you would expect them it's a really nice construction my only complaint was of course the little uh, wires connected to the laser I'm gonna fix that before closing it up there's no reason to really open this part because it's just a battery and the capacitor underneath it nothing uh, other than that very very nice design my thumbs up for its simplicity. I love it when they can get a lot of functionality from so few components. And here's my little improvement to the laser module. You can see it's nicely shrink tube. Now I resolder the cables. It should hold up much better. Not too bad. And if you ever purchase any Flare products, you'd know that they always supply all kind of connectors for the power supply. So it's, it's basically an international unit. And I really like that because you can go anywhere in the world and have one of these charges. And this actually can become something you can take with you on the trips because the power supply is a generic 5 volt switching power supply. And it's capable of putting out uh, one amp at 5 volts. And it has a USB cable connector to it. So you can charge pretty much anything with it, which is great. This is uh, from a company called Golden Profit Electronics, made in China. Golden Profit? Well, if Flare is going to distribute your product, Golden Profits indeed. And it, uh, very nice and here's the cable that comes with it obviously a micro USB cable also good quality cable nice chalk definitely built into it and you can be able to you should be able to use any firewall power supply presumably to charge this so you can even use your cell phone power supply you don't have to necessarily use this one and it of course also comes with this very important uh, pin type moisture measurement and now this plugs directly into the unit as I showed you and on this side we expect to see two pins which can be plugged into the surface uh, for measurement and this nicely attaches to the cable so it doesn't get lost and anyone who works in the industry in the field knows how convenient that can be and here are the pins that you have to basically push onto a surface so you can measure the resistance between them and then from that you can estimate the moisture content now these pins are very very sharp and as they should be and they seem like very hard material which is exactly what you want because you don't want these things to dull out and not be able to penetrate the surface you're trying to measure I've already kind of stabbed my table with it a couple of times really hard to see if they remain sharp and I have to say they are <laughs> dangerously sharp and we're going to definitely try it on something as part of our experiment but this is pretty much all the accessory that you're going to get there's obviously a printed uh, manual as well but that you can get that anywhere online and I'm pretty happy with uh, the overall accessories and uh, for, from everything that comes with it it's everything you need to get started nothing is left out so let's go turn it on do some measurement let's do a quick power on test 
Switch the button. There it is. There's our Flare logo. Let's see how long it takes for this thing to boot up and be ready to use. And there it is, up and running, pretty quick, which is great. You don't want to be waiting for a long time in the field uh, trying to get the instrument up and running. Now, obviously, there's a lot of glare uh, on the screen uh, because of the lighting and room and the camera, so I'm going to find a, a nice angle where we can avoid that. And, you know, this is definitely up and running. Is my finger right underneath it. So let's find a nice angle that we can examine the GUI closely. So let's briefly familiarize ourselves with the menu system of this instrument and right now it's facing a plastic background so all the temperature is very uniform and this is why you're getting this uh, kind of gray screen. At the top left we have the moisture measurement is set to the touchless mode and there is nothing behind it so you're seeing zero and if I go ahead and put my hand right behind the unit to hold it you can see that the number will drastically change and that's just measuring the moisture content in my hand. Now I can go ahead and press the center button on the directional panel to bring up the menu and as soon as I do that you can see in the top left then now we have the battery symbol showing the battery content once the menu is actually uh, enabled and the left here we have the image review which is the images that you've stored and if I click on the right again under image mode I have a couple of options I can just you know get rid of the, uh, the all the moisture measurements all together and only have the infrared image there which is fine or I can just have only the moisture measurement this can be pretty handy once you're uh, using for example the pins to measure the moisture content of something and you're only looking at moisture content at that point you don't want to have have the image anymore and which the nice big letters with a bar at the bottom which can be quite handy so let's go back to this mode once again and on, over here I have the mo moisture mode right now it's set to pinless which is exactly what we're getting I can select the pin mode then it will start switching and looking for resistance or I can enable this uh, reference so once I put a reference it's going to do a relative measurement and once I click that you can see that now it's basically showing the difference between the last measurement which was a 90% and if I click again it's going to do a new measurement and so on and on which is fine but I couldn't find a way to get rid of this reference once it's set it's just there all the time which can be kind annoying I'm sure this is something they can easily change in the firmware and hopefully they can uh, allow the user to get rid of it once it's set or I can also go under lock span now lock span is uh, obviously referring to the infrared image there once you lock the span it's similar to locking the exposure on a camera and then if the lepton sensor will no longer auto range it will be at the last range you had selected so it will show depending on a certain dynamic range of the temperature which can be pretty handy if you're looking around you don't want the camera to continuously auto range it for you uh, under the settings here we have a few uh, useful options the language uh, selection obviously now you can also change the palette which is very nice the ice palette is the default one where any temperature below a certain amount will show up as blue but you can also change it to grayscale get rid of that altogether or go to iron which is a typical thermal uh, camera view and we will see that there's also the rainbow another uh, form of uh, color mode that you can select you can have an alarm and the alarm can be set such that if your moisture exceeds a certain amount you get a little alarm there to warn you and there's an auto power off and so on date and time basic stuff and here's for example my meter information the model number and the version and uh, of the firmware and i've updated the firmware to the last version which might be quite nice because they added a lot of nice features to it now one of the things if you have noticed is that there is no way to show the temperature that information is obviously available in the unit but i could not find a way to show it on the screen and I believe this is intentional because they don't want this to turn into a kind of like a one instrument do it all so that probably doesn't eat into the other lineup of the product it would be amazing if they show the temperature as well because you know this really would be multifunctional we will take a look and see how it performs as a thermal camera on its own but maybe hopefully they will add that other than that, everything else is really, really straightforward. Very simple menu. It's nice and fast. If you've used any FLIR product, you know exactly what to expect. And if I press the laser button, you get a little crosshair uh, right in the center. And that crosshair is just uh, exactly where the laser would line up. And we'll take a look at it as well. So I have an experiment set up here, which is a basic uh, real-life uh, situation you may be faced with. Let's take a look at it. So here we're looking at a type of tiling material that is often used, for example, as office buildings. And these things on the ceiling have pipes and other things above them. And they're often actually have a lot of marks on them. And this is a white one, obviously. So you can see some discoloration here, some discoloration here. And this could be a result of moisture from the past, or it could be a recent leak that's developing that you'd really want to catch early. Now, sometimes these are really far away. You can't even reach them. So obviously you don't want to go in and, and try and find out where the moisture is by touching it or actually putting Putting a pin in it you want to scan the area before uh, do, devoting your time to it so here's an example of that and this material because it's white it actually has this coloration in the visible range sometimes this material is not white and then you will never even see this discoloration will be completely the same color to the visible 
uh, spectrum that would be even harder to find if you were if you're looking for it visually so now let's go ahead and take the FLIR MR160 and take a look at this um, through the thermal perspective and see if you actually see any imperfections on it so what does the thermal camera see well here it is and check it out there is definitely some problem areas you can clearly see that two highlighted areas one is much more severe than the other so obviously that's the one that you want to pay attention to first I'm sorry if this is shaking a little bit it's difficult to hold it and speak at the same time but if I go ahead and activate the laser pointer and point to the area you can see right there that's in fact matching exactly where the laser pointer is and that is one of the problem areas and the other problem area will then be all the way there so this is something then at least worthwhile for us to go ahead and take a closer look at but it's so easy to see this because of the thermal properties uh, that is, is being detected now if this again as I said before if this material did not have those markings on it and you would never see it visually at all and you have to rely on this to quickly find them imagine walking through hallways and looking at the ceiling and finding a problem area right away without having to even be close to it now what does this area actually measure if I were to measure it on uh, based on the pinless moisture let's go ahead take a closer look and see what it reports to us so now we are much closer to the suspect area and you can see that this area was is going to be a problem let's go and verify that that's in fact definitely a moisture issue because if you see a cold spot it could for example be due to the air conditioning being close to the ceiling or perhaps a small leakage in the air conditioning blowing onto the surface causing it to cool down it may not necessarily actually be a moisture problem so this is where the moisture measurement comes into play for us to verify so here it is I've set the instrument to only measure moisture to make it a little bit simpler and there it is you can see it actually says zero for this material this is a really really dry material and if I go on the left on the suspect area and check it out wow it's 68 percent actually 75 percent so it has a lot of moisture content in this area alone now the other area was down below which showed uh, less moisture so we can actually go over there and see uh, if indeed we get less moisture problem from there so there's the other area and I can go ahead and again do exactly the same thing and roll over and see and oh yeah there you go you can see we see some moisture but it's not so bad it's only 2.4 2.5 percent so we can we are able to detect that thermally uh, even at such a tiny amount of moisture but this means that this is most likely not such a big deal and maybe it's um, something that's drying up or perhaps some old thing that has been repaired but the moisture problem at the top here is something that definitely needs to be uh, addressed now as a result now let's say you want to also verify this by using the pin so we can go ahead and try and measure it using the pin method so now let's investigate using the pin method. So here are my pins right here. And I'm going to plug it over here, for example. I'm going to push it into the material. I'm going to leave it. And, you know, it's, it says it's dry. And in fact, it should be because it didn't show up on the thermal camera and it didn't show up on the pinless method. Now let's move that to the area that we suspect has moisture and verify that indeed there is a problem. And there it is. Check it out. We can detect that. Now, here I've selected group one. I don't exactly know this type of material, but you, you, if you know the material, then you can get a precise measurement. And this is going to depend on how well this is pushed in and so on. So the two, two, res two results are going to have to match under some conditions, which you have to ensure, and you know, depending on the depth of the moisture and so on. But it certainly can easily and quickly verify that there is, in fact, a problem in this material. And this is so fast and so quick. And the interface is very straightforward. And the other thing you can do is that now you can take pictures, save this result, save all of your measurements, and then create a report using the FLIR software. And then you can have that as part of your report, you know, after, uh, from your investigation. So I'm really, really happy with that. It's pretty easy and straightforward to use. Now the question is, of course, most of you guys who are watching are interested in electronics too. How well is this going to work for looking at electronic circuits? So I've prepared a little experiment for that as well. Let's take a look and see how it behaves. So for our next setup, I have 10 resistors over here that are all in series. Now the power dissipation of these resistors would then be a function of linear function of the resistance value only. And I have this in a, you know, trending in a linear fashion. So therefore, if I pass a constant current through it, we're going to get a gradient of power and therefore a gradient of temperature. The exact temperature depends on the thermal resistance of these individual resistors to the ambient. And I don't know what that value is, but nonetheless, that doesn't matter. We're still going to get a a gradient of temperature that I'm interested to look at with a the thermal camera and I'm going to push current in it using the Kitli 2450 and that can go all the way up to 100 volts so we can put a lot of uh, uh, current through it. The first resistor starts at 1 kilo ohm, the last one ends at 
uh, about 5.6 ohms. So you're going to get a quite a nice range there. So I'm interested in looking at it right now. The instrument is off, and if I were to look at that, we see nothing. In fact, this instrument, the uh, MR160, so aggressively auto scales uh, this the range of the temperatures that it makes it sometimes a little difficult to see things. So as soon as I bring my hand in, you can see it instantaneously changes the range of temperature. Oh, it's actually going to power off now. There we go. So uh, there you go. So you can see you can see my hand very clearly, and the resistors are right next to my hand right now. So they're they're definitely all at the same temperature as ambient. And as soon as I remove my hand, then the temperature range changes. Now that's where the locking the scale comes in. So if I lock the scale right now, when I remove my hand, then the scale will not change anymore. And that can be very handy when you're looking at electronic stuff. So let's go ahead back to the normal mode, and I'm going to go and enable the current, and let's see what happens. There we go. And we're beginning to see the individual resistors warming up. Now, because they're so small compared to the full frame, we're still going to get this auto ranging. Now, if I bring my hand in, you can still clearly change the range. So let me keep my hand in there and let's go ahead and lock the scale. So this way we're looking at it like you would look at, you know, when you're trying to debug some piece of electronic. And you can clearly see a couple of the resistors and in gradient they're changing in terms of how bright they show up on this palette. I'm using the iron palette. I can go ahead and change the palette. For example, go over here and change the palette to rainbow, for example. And you can see very clearly where those individual res hot resistors are. So we can even go ahead and push it further and destroy these resistors and see what happens. Let's put twice the current in there. I'm trying to do too many things at the same time here. There we go. Now they are going to be very, very hot. So the first one might actually start uh, to burn up. But there you go. You can see the individual points. Now you're beginning to see uh, some hot spots actually directly forming uh, on the PCB itself. And I can smell the resistor already. So you don't see all of them obviously because the range is limited. Now we can go back for example and change the auto scale again and now there is so much heat there that uh, it actually keeps the scale where it's supposed to be and I can smell the resistor. So this would be an indication you know, of debugging electronics and this is why I was saying it would be so good if this thing reported the temperature to you because it obviously has that. There you go, you can see the resistor is smoking away. So there you go and it uh, looks good. So you should definitely be able to debug electronics with it and I would love it if they were to add that one other functionality of actually seeing the temperature. Now I'm going to turn this off before we start a fire over here. So there it is, you know, I wanted to show you an overview of what you can do with it and um, if they were to add a couple of these missing functionalities like showing the temperature for example and a few other things in our, they don't have an accelerometer so if you rotate the camera like this and the picture stays in the same orientation but for the intended application it works really really well and uh, if you like it give the video a thumbs up, leave me a comment, ask any questions if you want something else to be tested and if you happen to buy one of these from FLIR because you saw this video, let them know that you saw the video on the signal pack. I don't get any portion of the sales, of course. This is just so that I can have a good relationship with FLIR and bring you more interesting thermal camera reviews in the future. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Until next time.